in this video, I'll show you how to do some of the most important aspects of on-page SEO. When it comes to SEO, this is where the rubber meets the road. On-page SEO consists of making sure your web pages are relevant and useful enough to rank for their target keywords. For example, it includes how and where to use your target keywords on a web page, and more generally, what to actually put on that web page in order to appeal to both Google and visitors. On-page SEO affects what happens in two places. The first is on the search engine results page, or the SERP for short, meaning search snippets that Google shows people when they search for something. The links, images, and text that Google shows for each web page are mostly controlled by what the owners of those web pages put on them. The rankings of those web pages also have a lot to do with on-page SEO. So if you do a great job with your on-page SEO, you're much more likely to rank well on Google. And the other thing that on-page SEO affects, of course, is the web page itself. What users and search engine web crawlers see when they visit the site. We'll talk a little bit more about web crawlers a little later. Now, when it comes to on-page SEO, there are hundreds of things we could talk about, but we're going to use the 80-20 rule here and focus on the most important ones. I'll walk you through them with an example of a well-optimized web page. If you Google the keyword Roth 401k, you'll see an article from Investopedia ranking number one. A Roth 401k is a type of retirement account, by the way. For this keyword in particular, SEMRAS shows us that it's a fairly difficult keyword to rank for and that it gets over 27,000 searches per month in the US. Investopedia ranks number one for a lot of investing related keywords like this. They rank in the top three for over 600,000 keywords and they get tens of millions of organic search visits per month overall. Those are some great results. So let's look at this one page to break down how they're doing it. The first on-page SEO factor I want to tell you about is keyword usage. Google recommends including any keywords you care about in your on-page SEO content because it helps both the search engine and users understand what your content is about. In other words, if you want a page to rank for a specific keyword, it's important to use that keyword on the page. That said, Google understands that there are alternate spellings, plurals, and synonyms of different keywords. For example, this Investopedia page also ranks number one for alternate spellings of Roth 401k without the parentheses. That's technically not the right way to spell it, so the actual article doesn't have it written that way. But it still ranks number one because Google knows it means the same thing. This page is also ranking well for secondary keywords that aren't just alternate spellings or synonyms. Keywords like, what is a Roth 401k? In practice, an individual web page often ranks for hundreds or even thousands of related keywords like this. But that doesn't mean you should try to cram a thousand different keywords into one blog post. Google has gotten really good at understanding the meanings behind different phrases and how they're related. It's common for a page to rank for a lot of keywords that don't even show up in text on the page. Generally, if you can include your most important keywords on the page, it will help it rank for those keywords. Just don't overdo it. If your human visitors don't like the page, neither will Google. So back to the Google SERP for the Roth 401k keyword. You can see every snippet on this page says Roth 401k at least once, and usually multiple times. These snippets are being created from information in a few different places from the web page, and it's a good idea to include your main target keyword in all of them. First up, the blue title link part of the Google snippet is usually based on the page's title tag. The title tag is an element in the HTML of the web page. You can see the HTML of any web page by just right-clicking on the page in your browser and then hitting View Source. Here's the title tag for this Investopedia page. By the way, even though I'm showing you how these tags look in the HTML code, it doesn't mean you need to learn how to code in order to write your own. All the popular website builder platforms let you do it pretty easily from the admin interface. So if you have your own website using Shopify, Squarespace, Wix, WordPress, or anything like that, it will be no problem. Or if you work with a company that has a custom build website, you'll generally ask their developers to add the tags you want and they'll handle it. Anyway, the title tag is one of the most important places to include your main target keyword. 
it helps make the page rank better on Google, and it also helps convince users to click on the link in your snippet, which will bring you more traffic and indirectly help your rankings even more. Some pointers for title tags are to make them under 60 characters long. If they're too long, Google will either cut them off or ignore them and write their own title link. Include your main target keyword in a natural way, like it's part of an article headline or an open question. And you may want to add your brand name to the end, especially if it's a well-known brand. In some cases, this will cause it to get more clicks. But Google will often add your brand's name to the title link if there's space, even if you don't actually put it in your title tag. Another place you may also want to include your target keyword is in the meta description. The meta description is used to fill in the plain text description part of a Google snippet. Now, Google often takes text from other parts of the web page and uses that instead of the meta description. So meta descriptions are becoming a little less important, but it's still a good idea to use them and to use the primary target keyword in them when you can do so naturally. Some pointers for meta descriptions are to make them under 160 characters long, include your primary target keyword in a natural way, preview what users will find on the page, or include some helpful information. Overall, your title tag and meta description are super, super important. They work like an advertisement for your web page. So it's good to include your main target keyword in them, but it's even more important to write them in a way that will make people want to click on them without being spammy. For example, don't include your keyword a bunch of times in an unnatural way. And don't just make it a list of multiple keywords either. Also, don't use all capital letters like you're shouting or a million exclamation points. Instead, try to show people that your page is going to give them the information they're looking for in a trustworthy way. And another good place to include the keyword is in the URL, or more specifically in the URL slug. This is the last part of the page's URL. In fact, I generally recommend just using the target keyword as the URL slug with hyphens instead of spaces. So something like example.com slash best hyphen dog hyphen toys is a good URL, assuming the target keyword is best dog toys. It's short and it's descriptive. A bad example would be something like example.com slash article 13239 because it isn't descriptive. Another bad example would be example.com slash best dog toys for your dog in 2023 and beyond. This one is too long and will get cut off on the Google SERP. Plus, the year part gets outdated as you update the content over time. And finally, you should also include the keyword within the main content of the web page. Let's go back to that Investopedia article to see how they do it. If we do a Command F or Control F to find the phrase Roth 401k on this page, we'll see it shows up dozens of times. It's up here in the main headline, which is in what's called an H1 heading tag. It's in the table of contents on the left several times, which means it's also in the smaller H2 heading tags, including this first one you can see below the image. And it comes up over and over again throughout the body text on the rest of the page. Notice that these sentences are very natural though. The article is very easy to read, and it doesn't seem like they're forcing it. That's really important. Unnaturally forcing keywords into your content will hurt more than it helps. You definitely don't have to include your primary target keyword dozens of times, but you should try to include it at least a few times. One last place you should try to include your keyword is in at least one image's alt text and file name. An image's alt text, or alt attribute, is a short piece of text that gets displayed if the image doesn't load properly. It also gets read aloud by screen readers for users who are visually impaired. And when it comes to SEO, Google reads alt text to understand what the image contains. It's best to make alt text descriptive without being overly long. Most alt text is under 10 words or 125 characters. So if you have an article about stop signs with an image of a stop sign, you could use alt text like red stop sign on a busy road. Google also uses an image's file name to help understand what the image contains. And it's best to make this descriptive, but short. So for an image of a stop sign, it would be better to use a file name like stop sign on an empty road.png instead of 
img4827501.png. If you have any images on your page that legitimately feature your target keyword in some way, it's good to include that keyword in the alt text and file name. This can also help you get traffic from Google Image Search. But as usual, don't force it. Now to sum up, here are the places to try to include your target keyword. The title tag, meta description, and URL slug. The main headline on the page, which usually means in an H1 heading tag. At least one of the secondary headings on the page, which are usually in H2 heading tags. Toward the beginning of the body text of the page, for example, in the introduction. Throughout the rest of the page, in normal text as needed while remaining natural, and in an images, alt text, and file name. And that wraps up keyword usage. While using keywords on the page is important, remember not to overdo it. Otherwise, the writing will come across as over-optimized and untrustworthy. Ultimately, Google's job is to make human users happy, which means your page needs to do that too, or else it isn't going to rank very well. Which brings us to the single most important aspect of on-page SEO, addressing search intent. Search intent is the underlying need or question people have when they search for a given keyword. Google wants everyone who makes searches to come away satisfied. So if you want to rank well for a keyword, you have to satisfy the person who's searching for it. Earlier, we used the four basic categories of search intent to help evaluate keywords. But now we're going to look at search intent a little differently and we're going to use it to figure out exactly what to include on our web pages. By that I mean, we're going to figure out what type of page we need to create. For example, should it be a blog post, a free tool, or a product page of some kind? What subtype of a page it should be? For example, if it's a blog post, should it be a list article, or an in-depth guide, or an X versus Y comparison post, or something else? And what topics we should discuss on the page as well as how long and detailed to make it. For any given keyword, there will be a number of related topics and things people want to learn about. And we need to cover them if we want our page to rank well. But at the same time, we don't want to go overboard if someone is just looking for a quick answer. So what's the right balance? The almighty Google can answer all these questions for us. We just have to look at what's already ranking well for our target keyword. The top ranking web pages for the Roth 401k keyword are mostly blog posts. So that answers our first question. To rank in the top five for this keyword, we should create a blog post. Now to answer our other questions, we need to find out what format of blog post that we should use, what topics to cover in it, and how long and detailed to make it. Let's open up a few of these other top ranked blog posts to see what they look like. We'll kind of ignore the IRS page because it's an official government page about the topic, which gives it a huge advantage. So it might rank in the top five just for that reason, even if it doesn't actually cover everything we need to cover for our own page to rank. The Investopedia blog post covers a definition of what a Roth 401k is, then talks about their features, like contribution limits and withdrawals, advantages and disadvantages, compares Roth 401ks to other accounts like traditional 401ks and IRAs, and so on. Charles Schwab's blog post takes this slightly different should you consider a Roth 401k approach in the title and introduction. It covers some of the same topics as the Investopedia page, comparing Roth versus traditional 401ks, and showing the different features of each. But it's a shorter article and not as detailed. And Fidelity's blog post is more similar to the Charles Schwab one. It again takes this angle of helping the reader decide whether this type of account is right for them. And it compares the different types of accounts again and talks about the main features. And it's again shorter than the Investopedia one, covering fewer related topics. You can kind of see how the Investopedia article is outranking the other two, since it's more in depth and just seems more useful. As you can see here, the Investopedia article also has a much faster time to value. By that, I mean it's immediately useful or valuable to readers. It defines what a Roth 401k is for people who just want to know that. Then it gets into a little more detail about that. Then it shows takeaways. 
And then it gets into much more detail and different related topics, all broken out in an easy to skim way with descriptive subheadings, short paragraphs, and bullet points, and comparison tables. Whereas the Charles Schwab article, and especially the Fidelity article, do a much worse job of those things. The Fidelity article wastes a bunch of time in the introduction with quotes from people that aren't really helpful. It's also not very easy to skim because it has lots of walls of text. So if we wanted to create a page to rank in the top five for this keyword, we would want to take inspiration from these top ranked pages, and especially the Investopedia one. There's a lot more we could do here to manually research these different articles in order to create our own page. But SEMrush has a tool to make this a lot easier. It's called the SEO Content Template, and you can find it in the Content Marketing section of the left-hand menu in SEMrush. Let's pop over to that tool and add Roth401k as our keyword, and hit Create Content Template. So this shows us the top ranking pages at the top for this keyword. And then underneath that, it shows semantically related words. These are some of the most common phrases that come up repeatedly in the top ranked pages for this keyword. We don't have to include all of these verbatim in our own article, but we'll usually have a better chance of ranking well if we cover the topics and ideas that are shown here. Covering these will also help us rank for additional related keywords beyond just our primary keyword. And then the next section shows a little context around how our competitors are using our target keyword. Now let's use the SEO Writing Assistant to help us actually write the content for our page. You can find this tool right below the SEO Content Template tool in the left-hand menu. So here at the top, you can see it's already pulled in our Roth 401k SEO template. And we have two options with it. We can do a quick check or we can do send to Google Docs. The quick check lets us copy and paste in an article draft we've already written. Since we don't have our own article yet, we can see what it looks like when we just paste in the Fidelity article. So we'll click quick check and then we'll paste in the text from that Fidelity article, which I copied off screen. So it says this, is, this actually looks pretty good overall, but it calls out some of the issues that I mentioned before. Uh, so the long paragraphs and the missing keywords or subtopics of the Investopedia piece covers. And uh, it even catches some missing alt text. So that's cool. You can click on any of these categories at the top also to get more information on them. For example, the readability score will check whether it's long enough with short enough paragraphs and not overcomplicated in terms of word choice. Readability is super important. And clicking the SEO part will show even more recommended keywords to cover with the ones that are already covered highlighted in green. So you can use this part of the tool to get tips on improving your content. There's also that send to Google Docs option over here to move to Google Docs now. This lets us get to work on the draft in Google Docs using the SEO Writing Assistant extension to get feedback on it as we go. It actually shows all the same information as it shows here, but only in Google Docs as you're writing. Now let's sum up the tips that I've given you so far about writing content for SEO. The first thing we covered was to include keywords in several key places on the page, but only if you can do it in a natural way. SEMrush's SEO template and SEO writing assistant can help you with this. But the most important thing is to fulfill the search intent meaning making your content satisfy the needs of the people who will read it. And you can figure out how to do this by using SEMrush's SEO template, as well as by looking at the top ranking pages for the main keyword. And as you write the content, focus on readability. Some quick points here are that you want skimmable text that doesn't waste readers' time with long introductions, short paragraphs, bullet points, descriptive sub subheadings, and easy to follow sentences are all great. And use images to help break up the text. SEMrush's SEO Writing Assistant can help you with this part. I'll wrap up this lesson by showing you one more tool that you can use to quickly check any existing web page or website 
for common on-page SEO issues. In SEMrush, under the SEO section of the left-hand menu, we'll open the on-page SEO checker tool. Let's use investopedia.com as the website and submit it like that. We'll keep this on the, as the US and continue. And then we have several options for which pages to have it analyzed. I'm just going to use this default auto import function here to start with these 50 pages. It'll take a minute or, two or so to go through all those pages and then it'll show us how well optimized they are. Now that it's done loading, we can scroll down to the top pages to optimize, which are basically sorted based on potential. We'll click on the blue View Ideas button to get specific recommendations for this first page. And the tool shows us a nice report of all the things it checked with tips for improving the page. I don't think we need to go through every single one of these, but as you can see, it covers a lot of the things that we just talked about, plus some others. So if you're working with an existing website, this on-page SEO checker tool is your best friend. It can really make your life a lot easier. And it even gets into some off-page SEO and technical SEO stuff, which we'll talk about in the next lessons. And that wraps up this lesson about on-page SEO.